the thank you, Brian, for the great introduction, and thanks uh, to COA for allowing me to um, participate in this uh, great symposium. And uh, these are my disclosures. We do get fellowship support uh, from the AOA, AO Spine, and Nuvasive. I uh, am a consultant for Nuvasive and Therapeutics, none of which are uh, relevant to my talk today. Uh, notably, disc arthroplasty is approved for both one and two level use from C3 to C7. Uh, although this talk may talk about other uh, more, multiple level utilization of disc arthroplasty for certain types of pathologies, uh, we want to uh, really emphasize that currently it's only for one and two level use. So let's start off with a case. There's a 41 year old woman who had a uh, worsening neck and shoulder pain, numbness in the C7 distribution. And if you can see her x-rays, uh, flexion and extension views, she has a congenital fusion at C4, C5. C3, 4 has a little bit of anterolisthesis on flexion. C5, C6 looks reasonable on flexion and extension. And C6, C7, there is some uh, loss of disc height along with a C7, T1. She has a very long, lanky neck. And um, her main problem is fairly severe C7 radiculopathy and neck pain. And she had a large herniated disc at C6, C7, which we uh, elected to treat uh, with a cervical disc arthroplasty at that level, uh, hoping that we could spare the C5, 6 level due to the prior congenital fusion. If I had done a fusion of the C6, C7 level, the intercalary segment at C5, C6 would have pretty much uh, deteriorated fairly rapidly and she would have needed uh, a longer fusion at that point fairly shortly after the index operation. So we tried to treat her uh, uh, from just with that disc arthroplasty, hoping to spare some motion as well as decrease the stresses on C5, C6. This is the second case that I'm gonna present, which is a 50 year old gentleman with neck and bilateral arm pain, had a prior C4, 5 anterior cervical discectomy infusion for a disc herniation and developed adjacent segment disease over the ensuing five or six years and did not wish to proceed with any further extension of fusion operation, although he, did, he had three symptomatic levels adjacent to his index fused level. And he, uh, this was probably about 15 years ago and he went to Europe and got uh, a three level M6 disc implants at C3, 4, C5, C6, and C6, C7. And obviously he was seeing me because he still had discomfort uh, and wanted to have some idea of what to do about it. So using these two cases as kind of a background, um, we can start off with the discussion of cervical disc arthroplasty. And as in the first, you know, early on, the, the first discs that we were introduced to were the the Brian disc, which is the one up here on the far upper left-hand corner. And then the Pro Disc C, which were the two main discs that were in IDE trials in the early 2000s. Um, the Prestige ST, uh, which had this metal on metal configuration was actually also used at that time and had finished early clinical trials. And the early trials for all these discs had uh, fairly good outcomes and Subsequently, more disc designs were then uh, created, and these include the Moby C, as you see here, as, long as, a pre as well as a Prestige low profile, or the LP Prestige, which is a ceramic type of a bearing surface. And then the M6 disc, which has uh, currently uh, been introduced probably the last couple of years. And interesting enough, my patient uh, that went to Germany had that M6 disc put in about 15 years ago. So they were doing clinical trials and using it uh, clinically um, in Europe way before we were using it in the US. So on, on, in, in summary, on the whole, you know, if you look at all the disc replacements, uh, their performance is pretty much the same because we're treating radiculopathy mainly and some spinal cord compression, which is an indication. And if you look at patients' arm, arm pain uh, improvement, Improvements, they significantly improve as you would expect because we're treating a disease process that is that has typically a good outcome with surgical treatment, right? This is in contrast to some of the lumbar disc replacements, which we're treating degenerative disc disease and low back pain. 
So patients tend to have a very quick improvement within the first uh, eight weeks of surgery and improvement in their arm pain and as well as their neck pain tend to last over time and certainly throughout the uh, follow-up period of many of these clinical trials. And this is true for almost every single cervical disc implant. So every implant that you that, that is on the market right now will have very much the same predictable profile because we're treating the same disease entity, which is cervical radiculopathy mainly. And as you can expect, uh, their functional outcomes are also improved and they maintain uh, uh, a very high rate of improvement over time, upwards of two years for the most studies, some upwards of seven to 10 years now. And I've had patients now since the first pro to C trials uh, I started, which are now, they're now probably about 15, 15 years out from their uh, indexed operations and still doing quite well. Uh, same thing again, prestige LP, you see all a drastic decrease in um, the, their M NDI scores, which is uh, showing the vast improvement over time. And that uh, improvement seems to be sustained, uh, at least in the prestige LP, now 10 years follow up. And uh, motion tends to increase if you, if you see the um, uh, slide on, the, on the, the graphic on the left, the motion tends to increase after you implant the implant and then slowly diminishes slightly over time. And we see that over, over time from the majority of disc implants, they do lose a little bit of motion over time. Um, reoperation rates tend to be very uh, favorable towards ADR and uh, upwards of seven to 10 years, reoperation rates continue to be lower than that of ACDF. And then here's the holy grail, which is adjacent segment disease. Does cervical disc replacement uh, decrease the progression of radiographic adjacent segment disease? And that appears to be suggested by the, uh, by the, the uh, clinical trial data. And uh, certainly uh, both the inferior and, and superior adjacent segments seem to have less degeneration. The MOBI-C was the now kind of the gold standard that we hold up multi-level disc replacement trials to. So most, mo most mo multi-level disc replacement trials are using the MOBI-C uh, randomization to, uh, to compare to because that showed a superiority over two-level ACDF. And when you look at the NDI as well as the um, as well as the neck uh, and um, as well as the uh, arm pain and neck pain uh, VAS scores, they show a significant improvement uh, that seems to be persisting over time. Adjacent segment disease is for multiple level uh, disc replacement or two level disc replacement for the MOBI-C clinical trial also shows a significant difference between two level MOBI-C and two level ACDF. So in general, Disc replacements are very, very uh, good, uh, good options for the right patient. And the pitfalls and complications that occur after disc replacement are often due to the fact that we haven't chosen a good patient to operate on with the right, uh, type, right type of pathology and the right uh, type of clinical, uh, uh, clinical presentation. And most complications and uh, issues are due to stretching indications. So there's a lot of inclusion criteria for disc replacement, right? You have to have C3 to C7. You have to have, you know, for one level trials, it was one level, but now you can do two levels that have, uh, that require surgical treatment. You have a certain preoperative neck disability index score. Who, who looks at that? I never look at the preoperative neck dis disability index score when I actually say, you, you know, tell a patient that you need, uh, you would do well with the disc arthroplasty, right? So some of these things, these inclusion criteria are based solely on the clinical trial inclusions. And it's not really practical from where we use, where we decide who's going to be a good candidate for this type of an operation. And typically these are younger people with herniated discs, not a lot of severe spinal stenosis that's due to spondylosis, no facet disease, or minimal, minimal facet and certainly not symptomatic facet disease and um, can uh, undergo a, a fairly, you know, that doesn't have osteoporosis, doesn't have any inflammatory diseases that might cause bone loss or, uh, or some type of reaction 
to the implant. And um, if you have a good patient and you do the right surgery, you tend to have a good result. So people who have instability, who have, um, who have severe facet pathology, as I, did, I said, and, and poor bone quality uh, are patients who are probably not the great candidates for this. And I would also add to this people who have uh, uh, hypermobility of their spine, ligamentous laxity might not be great candidates if you're actually trying to put them, put an implant next to an area that's already been fused. Okay. So lots of uh, different things, but you know, you can use your common sense on who is a good candidate or not and follow some of the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, but these are relative. Some of these criteria are very relative and they're not, uh, uh, they shouldn't always be used um, strictly. Okay. So what can happen when you, uh, that's what can happen when you choose the wrong patient, but there are technical issues that also can occur that can lead to some potential problems. So this is a patient who's got shell kyphosis, and this is a person who had a one level TDR that I did that postoperatively you can see that the implant itself is in a little bit of kyphosis. The functional motion segment is not in kyphosis, but the implant is in kyphosis, which would limit the amount of flexion of that implant and actually cause potentially more facet, facetogenic uh, uh, stresses when the patient extends because the facets are gonna be the limit to the patient's extension versus the implant itself. So some things you have to uh, consider. And the reason why this happens um, is when you, when you have a tight space and you're trying to take out some of the bone in the back, when you put your Caspar pins in and you distract, you actually don't you know, evenly distract the space. You tend to fish mouth the space. And that's great when you're doing an ACDF because then you can just basically drill out the back of the spine. But in a disc replacement, we drill out too much of the back of the spine, you create a uh, you create a, uh, a situation where you've kind of remodeled the disc space so that it's wider in the back and the front. So when you put an implant in that can move, it then conforms to the space and goes into shell kyphosis. There, okay. Other things that can happen, some things that you can control, things like aseptic loosening. This is very, very rare because the, because the disc space, inner body space is not a... Um, Inner body space is not a, a synovial uh, joint. So usually this is due to either some inf low grade infection or due to a, um, a problem with a metal. And there are people who have metal allergies to cobalt and chrome that you have to be careful about because they can, uh, they can get uh, continued pain after surgery and loosening because of that. And here's a patient that from a technical standpoint, I think, uh, did not have a great uh, clean out of the end plate or preparation of the end plate leading to some lucency here. And when you go back in there uh, over time, you can see that the space had collapsed a little bit of the back of the uh, back of the vertebral body was taken out too much. The shell, the shell went into a little bit of shell kyphosis and there's still that lucency there. MRIs don't show anything as you can imagine they're very, very use, useless when, you, when you're trying to interrogate why a disc implant is failing. And then a CT scan looks pretty decent, but when you go in there and take an X-ray, you can see that lucency on the top shell over here. And when you take, uh, when you go and remove the implant, you realize that that little hook, that little inferior ossified that wasn't taken off, which you don't want to take off, during implantation, because you don't want to, you want to save as much good end plate bone as possible, that little cartilage underneath wasn't totally removed, and that cartilage is there so that it impedes the ingrowth of the prosthesis onto the host bone, leading to some loosening. And this patient was uh, revised to a, a single level fusion. And now you have a patient who has, uh, you know, we're trying to do something fancy, right? Where he has multi level disease. He's a physician. You know, you want to try to maintain some motion, so you top it off with an implant. But as you can imagine, this implant uh, is a little bit hypermobile, plus it was put in a little bit far back and the patient had uh, continued neural impingement and that needed to be revised. And I revised it to a multi-level anterior fusion. 
There's, uh, we talked about segmental hypermobility, and this is a very extreme example of that. And be wary, if you look at your ACDF data uh, very carefully, uh, you realize that the inferior, inferior segment uh, below the fusion tends to wear out a little bit faster. So that inferior segment has a lot more stresses on it than the superior segment above, superior adjacent segment above the fusion. And when you put an implant below a fusion, there's a higher potential risk of having failure of the implant due to the mechanical stresses. And same thing, uh, there's another example of segmental hypermobility leading to radicular pain. So this is going back to my first patient that I showed you. There's a patient that I tried to spare that five, six level by putting a disc replacement at six, seven. She did great for about nine months and developed segmental hypermobility. I put her in a collar, her, her radicular symptoms got better. And CT scan looks absolutely perfect. I went in there and what this is what you see when you go in there, you see the pseudo capsule in the front and you can, you know, it looks like uh, a disc. And when you take that pseudo capsule down, you can see the scar, you can see the disc implant underneath it. And you can just basically take the polyethylene out and then, uh, and then basically bring the shells into the space that you create and then remove the shells and you can revise it fairly easily. I did this, I revised it to an ACDF and then guess lo and behold, what happens next? She wore out the five, six level and I had to do that one as well, which is something that I wanted to avoid in the first place. But I don't know if I could avoid it anyway, uh, if I did anything uh, different. So uh, we talked about, we can talk about heterotopic ossification, which also can occur with mobile implants. And the heterotopic ossification that occurs is implant dependent depending on what is done in the techni technique of putting the implants in. If you, have a, if you have a Brian disc where you're milling the end plates, you really have to wash out the in inner body space very well to get all the bone marrow and bone debris out. Otherwise you'll develop HO in the back of the space in the spinal canal. For the Proteus C, which has a keel or any keeled devices, when you cut the keel out, you have to really wax that area because the bone marrow that comes out of that will cause heterotopic bone to form anteriorly. So there's a mix of things that occur. And finally, there is loss of motion. So as time goes by, these implants do lose motion. And if you, if you look at this individual who had the three levels put in adjacent to his prior fusion and his flexion extension, the C3-4 level isn't moving at all. And that C3-4 level doesn't seem, it's the tightest level in the cervical spine to place implants. And it's the hardest level to get moving. And sometimes when in the generated level, that level just doesn't want to move no matter what type of motion sparing device you put in. So this guy was revised to a three level uh, Protus Nova TDR. And he's actually doing very, very well. And that level actually uh, doesn't really move all that much still, but uh, from a from a technical standpoint, he had a good decompression on the second operation and the other two levels do seem to move over, still maintain some of the motion. So he's very happy. So this is, his motion, this is now 15 years out, okay? So there, you can see that his lateral bending is a little bit stiff because when you do a fusion of the spine, people can still have a good flexion extension and rotation all from C1 and C2, but their lateral bending is limited. Okay, so, and this is a uh, example of a person who had multi-level disc replacements done and the C3, 4 and C4, 5 have lost motion over time. And finally, last but not least, this is the person that I see almost every year to, to sign off on his, uh, commercial pilot's license. And he had multi-level uh, uh, disc degeneration with disc herniations leading to, in the, in the presence of congenital spinal stenosis, leading to myelopathy. And about uh, 16 years ago, he went over to Germany and had this four level replacement done. And this was back in, back when he had, uh, when he came back from Germany and he was doing, you can see, how much motion he has for four levels. And that's what he needed for his uh, TDR. And this is now 
15, 16 years later. You can see, uh, I'm not joshing because he is, he, he's looking older, right? So this, and as you can tell, he's lost a little bit of rotation. So his motion has diminished a little bit. However, it's a, it's pretty, pretty impressive um, that uh, he's maintained such motion and such good overall function. So he's still uh, flying planes, the commercial airplanes. So in conclusion, you know, single and two level uh, cervical disc replacements are safe and effective, short and intermediate term follow-up. You know, with arthroplasty, as we look up to upwards of 15 to 20 years, we'll have a better idea of when that polyethylene will start to wear out and when we'll have to replace it. Luckily, the majority of it, luckily the majority of these implants have modular systems where we can hopefully just replace the polyethylene and not have to revise the whole thing. The great for multi-level greater than two level cervical TDR, uh, very little data exists on efficacy, uh, but it's still done. And uh, some people have great outcomes, some people don't. And uh, it does suggest, uh, the data does suggest that we can slow down the rate of adjacent segment disease and certainly the rate of reoperations. And uh, the most important thing that you can learn from this is that if you maintain good selection criteria for your patients and pick the best patients to operate on, you'll have the best results. And that goes for not just cervical disc replacement, but for every, every type of operation that you uh, intend to do. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. And thank you, Brian, for letting me go a little bit over time. So I'm gonna stop the share and show, then stop share, and then I'll let it come back to you. Thanks so much, Bobby. So terrific talk. And I'm just going to go right into a few questions here. Um, I see, and I'm sure you see this, there are patients, and I think LA is where a lot of this is predominantly happening, um, Beverly Hills in particular. But I see people expanding the indications for cervical disc replacement like I've never really seen. And in one of the slides, you had inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, some of the, one of the exclusion criteria um, used to be loss of 50% disc height or more or spondylosis and, and flattening that disc. And I see people now getting up on national podiums and giving talks about how they're doing, you know, takedowns of really spondylotic levels where it's almost bone on bone, taking a cob, releasing the disc space and building in motion where motion wasn't there before with a disc replacement. I've seen it at one levels, at two levels. You know, I see, see guys doing three or four levels. Now, a lot of these are cash paying patients. Um, so I'm wondering a little bit, you know, clearly these guys are doing it and, and they wouldn't be doing it if they weren't getting, you know, re reasonably good outcomes. So what's your impression about how people are pushing the indications mm. And what do you think are reasonable indications to push? I mean, should you do somebody that their facets look fine, but they have really spondylotic disc spaces and you're trying to restore motion for these people? What's, what's your feeling on that? Where do you think the failures are going to be if we keep doing this? I think that's a great question, Brian. It's like, where, what, where do you stop, uh, you know, your, your technical skills overcome your ability to, uh, choose a good patient to operate on. Most of these things are patient driven. Clearly patients don't want uh, to have fusions anymore. Fusions, at least in California are really bad things. <laughs> and in fact, you know, some people actually are better off with a fusion. Clearly we, we know that. Um, and, th but some people are willing to live with some pain because they're so afraid of losing motion. And it's a very, very unique mindset because they're so fixated on not losing motion that they'll be able, they're willing to live with some pain. So they feel like they've had a good result because they were able to have maintained their motion and they can, they deal with the pain that, so if you look at them compared to somebody who's got an ACDF, a multi-level ACD, they might, the multi-level ACD patient might have a better NDI. And might have 
actually better VAS arm and neck pain scores. But the disc replacement patient is so happy with what their, pa their patient satisfaction is so exceedingly high. So, you know, those are the people that are going to go out and say, hey, you know, I got four levels done and you should go see this guy or this, this gal because it's, it's, it's so driven. It's like, it's like drug commercials in a way, you know, see your, see your doctor. If you got, if you want something for your, you know, erectile dysfunction now, it's like everything is on TV. If you, you know, if, if I had a rheumatoid disease, I'd have, I can get Remicade because on TV, they said that I should go find out some doctor who will give it to me. Right. So again, very patient driven. If you look at disc space collapse, there are patients who have rapid disc space collapse that have no facet arthritis. And if you look at their AP x-ray or their CT coronal image, they don't have a lot of uncle osteophytes or un bridging uncle bone. Those particular patients you can mobilize, I think, and get a good result. If you start to have a patient who's got fairly sizable uncle, uh, uncle vertebral osteophytes, and bridging across that, you're not going to be able to get them mobilized. And I know that there are people, even in our community, that try to take fusions down and and put in implants. I think that's a little bit crazy, right? I think I think that's way beyond the indication. But again, that's more patient driven than than not. Luckily, I haven't seen anybody that wants to take their implants out. There actually, there's a few from that individual that does that here. <laughs> However. Uh, th those are, I think those are, those are, those are my opinions on it. And then they're just, where do you think that failure is? Like if we, you know, take down a super spondylotic disc space and put a two level CDR in, do you think the failure is in that patient's going to have more neck pain? Do you think the failure is the physiologic collapse is going to lead to osteolysis or what do you, what do you think the downside of that is? So, so if you take out too much end plate bone to try to mobilize a space, you're going to get a subsidence and or loss of or you try to overstuff an implant into a very tight space it's not going to move right so if it doesn't move you're probably bet, you're probably okay because it's probably like a fusion inner body graft fusion right if you if you actually if it actually does move you you can either get uh, you know shifting of the implant because it's not congruent the implant surfaces are not congruent to the bone and you'll have like migration of the implant shell which can then lead to loss of motion in one plane or the other, or, or migration of the canal, which cause impingement. But what I've seen mostly is that when you try to take a very tight space and try to jack it open, you get a lot of facetogenic pain. And people have a lot of discomfort in the back of their neck because you've just stretched out that facet capsule in the back and maybe even, you know, maybe injured some of the tightened, uh, tightened soft tissues in the back. And hopefully you haven't done that below a prior stiff segment, which would then cause a, a hypermobility there. And um, so, so that's, that's, that's what I look at when I look, look for patients who have collapsed spaces. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's over 50%. Do they have a lot of lateral uncle vertebral osteophytes? Do they have facet disease? I tried to tell them that, you know, it may not move after I put it in, if you have too much. And, and some patients I say, you know, you're not, you're not a good candidate for a disc replacement. You're a much better candidate for a fusion. And after you tell them the, the rationale, they tend to accept that. They may go to somewhere else, but you know, that's okay, right? You know, if, if they're not willing to listen to you, then they're, they, they can do go somewhere else. So, uh, along those lines of kind of facetogenic pain, every, every CDR I do gets a CT and an MRI. And everyone says, you know, facet-based pain preoperatively, CDR is probably not a good idea, mostly because you, you have movement in the facet joints, right? Which, which, which makes sense. Um, the patient that has like the stir signal edema at like the C5-6 joint, clearly that patient's out, right? Because it's obvious. The person that has those huge osteophytes, those bulky osteophytes on the axial CT, that patient's out. Talk to you about your workup of whether or not someone's appropriate based on their symptomatology of neck pain, what the MRI shows. When the MRI looks basically clean, there's not a lot of edema, but the CT maybe shows a little bit of inferior spurring, you know, where the two facets come together. And so what are the, what's, what's going through your mind? And is there any role for SPECT CT? So a lot of people are starting to use SPECT CT to look at edema in the facet joints. 
And I don't even know what to make of a spec CT of a facet, but if it lights up, what does that even mean? You know, does it mean that's causing pain? Does it mean it's not? There's metabolic uptake. So talk to me about what's going through your mind when you're working up preoperatively facet-based pain if you want to do a CDR. Yeah. So this is a patient, you know, in a patient who's got some posterior neck pain and, you know, it, their epidurals, they usually have gone through epidurals. Their epidurals haven't really helped them. Uh, help their arm pain, but hasn't really helped the neck symptomatology. I asked them, can you live with your neck pain? If your neck pain is really bad and you want that addressed, then we're going to have to figure, figure out if your facets are causing it or your disc or whatnot, you know, because this discogenic neck pain can't, does exist. It's just hard to totally diagnose the, the facetogenic pain component. It's, it's a little bit more controversial. Now if that all that spec stuff is from the lumbar spine trying to figure out whether or not some person who's got pain of unknown origin, their low back might have facetogenic uh, pain. And I've used it. Not been exactly, you know, some light, some areas light up and you, you give them, a, try to do confirmatory injections and it doesn't really help them. So I usually use like facet, facet blocks to try to help me decide. And if they have extension pain and they, it gets better with a facet block, I tell them they're not a great candidate. And you like intra-articular or medium branch blocks? Uh, intra-articular blocks typically, um, because number one, the, the time when intra-articular blocks may not work is if they have too much advanced arthritis, right? And those are times, and those are times when medial branch blocks might be more helpful, I think. But if you if you do a uh, facet block on a person who's got reasonably decent looking facets and they look, you know, and they have, they have a lot of pain there, then I, I would try to dissuade them from having a, a, a motion sparing operation because the motion sparing operation doesn't exactly spare motion. It creates a little bit extra motion in the beginning before it stops. Right. So it slow down. Right. It, they become a little bit hypermobile. So, um, all right. Well, listen, we're going to, we're going to move on to, to Dr. Scheimer's talk. Uh, thanks Bobby for that, for that great, uh, great conversation. So uh, Adam is an associate professor of spine surgery at UVA. Um, he's a fellowship director as well. And uh, Adam, Adam and I were co-fellows together at Jefferson. And he and I both remember a time where, you know, you get flexion extension views and if that patient slips and the magic number is four millimeters, we're putting screws in, we're putting cages in. And as, as my practice has evolved in the last, you know, 12, 13 years, we've seen more and more, liter more, and more literature suggesting, you know, maybe not every spondylolisthesis is the same. And maybe everyone doesn't have to be fused. Um, and so... He always is very thoughtful about the literature. Um, Adam is somebody that I would have operate on a family member of mine or send a family member to. Um, and so I asked him to talk about how he's handling people with degen spondies these days. Uh, so Adam, why don't you go ahead and take it away and then we'll have a little bit of a uh, couple of questions after. That's great. Thanks so much, Dr. Sue. And thanks to the COA, I'd really like to um, you know, my heartfelt appreciation. I think uh, the COA made a good decision by having Dr. Sue uh, moderate and select these topics. He's always good at selecting, if not controversial topics, topics that we can sit here and talk about all night. So I'll try not to go too long. And I think he chose Tom and I and, and Bobby and him for an East Coast, West Coast, like an old school East Coast, West Coast battle. Because I'll just say, seeing some of those x-rays and hearing about the environment in uh, northern and southern California and what I, I'm known as the cervical disc replacement guy here in, at UVA. And even me, I like agonize over each single TDR. It's like a young patient, soft disc, junctional debt levels that don't look good. And then I see how people are expanding their indications into a multi-levels and severe spondylosis and collapsed discs and a little bit of instability and myelopathy. And I just think, boy, I don't know, I'm behind the time. So I'd like to thank Bobby for giving me a, a jolt of reality when it comes to what people are doing with uh, uh, cervical disc replacements. Uh, 